Relationships are an abstraction. They don't actually exist. You can't take a picture of a relationship, just people. So a relationship is made up in our heads, which is beautiful. We just have to make sure that we're making up the same thing. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today, I am honored to have Stan Tatkin. So I, I would like to describe you as a relational ninja in some way, because your ability to deconstruct and reconstruct not just the architecture of a relationship, but also the emotional nuances. Like I was reading just the description of what you do, a clinician, researcher, teacher, developer of a psychobiological approach to couples therapy. And when it was describing PACT, it says a polytheoretical nonlinear approach to dyadic systems that integrates developmental neuroscience, arousal, regulation, and attachment theory. And I was like, I'm going to have to regulate my arousal for the many scientific terms that were used in this. I love it. Um, I'm so excited to have you here. That's meant to attract clinicians to training. It's not really, it's not, it's not public friendly at all. In your approach to relationship, like on the podcast, there's a lot of understanding of somatics, attachment, but we should definitely, you know, refresh people on what is your particular lens and maybe how did you even just develop it? Like, where did your passion for relationship come from? Because you clearly do have a deep desire to understand and help couples navigate these tricky waters, I suppose. I've been, you know, as a therapist, uh, you know, uh, it's all been a relationship, but I've gone through many different iterations of myself as a professional uh, to this point. And uh, I, I would say that the, what led me to couples was working in prevention with infant uh, caregiver pairs, trying to prevent uh, axis one and axis two disorders, that is personality disorders and regular psychiatric disorders and so on. So, but I couldn't get people in to come in because prevention is not a great thing, uh, you know, in this country at least. And so it's hard to get people to do things that are preventative. So I switched over to couples and I found that there was a very, very similar structure in attachment to the primary attachment relationship in childhood into the symmetrical primary attachment relationship in romantic relationships itself. So all of this really, uh, you know, layered in terms of my learning, going from neurobiology to arousal systems to uh, personality disorders, all of this kind of led me here. And then I found that this is the most interesting specialization uh, that uh, I could ever find. And I haven't looked back since. So when you break down how a couple interacts and you were saying that correlation between child attachment to the caregivers and then our, we're sort of like repatterning or, or is it the familiarity of that, that, that brings us back into these relationships? Well, familiarity is pretty much everything. We're, we're memory animals. Everything we do is by memory. In fact, most of our day is fully automatic, uh, and uh, reflexive using memory, and we're not really thinking very much uh, at any point during any day because it's resource ex uh, expending. So we pair bond by familiarity, right? We pick somebody that we recognize either some aspect of ourselves or some aspect of our family culture, and they're stranger enough to be interesting, but they're familial enough to feel like we're fairly close to home. Um, and so, yeah, familiarity is a big deal. Attachment it just started this, this thing. It's not everything. Attachment is simply safety and security as felt by the individual. And that is a subjective experience starting all the way back from infancy throughout the lifespan. And unlike personality, it is flexible and plastic and shifting according to our current primary attachment relationship. People should understand that it's just memories of what happens when I depend on somebody. And it comes alive when we start to depend on somebody or they depend on us. And then we remember, along with all the good things, all the things we better protect ourselves from. And therein lies the difficulty with the attachment system in adult pair bonding. It's the memory of bad things happening. And then I have to protect myself. And I do so in a way that looks unfriendly to my partner. So to my partner, it looks like 
I may be attacking or threatening the connection, like threatening the attachment. I may be distancing too much, or I may be clinging too much. I may be over, uh, overly preoccupied with the relationship and, and fear abandonment or withdrawal or rejection or punishment, or I may distance myself uh, fearing uh, being trapped, having my autonomy or freedom taken from me, my agency, and, uh, and having my things taken as well. So it's an engulfment fear on the distancing side, an abandonment fear on the clinging side, both sides actually really driven by abandonment. That's just not as uh, front and center for the people in a distancing group. The first thing they become aware of is relief from uh, the intense interpersonal stress they feel ongoing with anyone that is really close to them. So the way to cope with whatever the insecurity is or the, the sense of lack of safety, which doesn't always mean it's actually there, right? Like the perceived, yeah. So the way to cope with it is either to push away or come close. That's right. Come close in, in a way that that for the ordinary person, that when I say ordinary, somebody who is secure uh, finds intrusive or finds overly dismissive distancing or derogating of attachment values, right? I don't need that. I'm not needy. I don't like needy. I like my alone time. Don't bother me. Don't interrupt me. What's mine is mine. What's yours is, well, maybe it's mine also. Um, <laughs> uh, as, a, as opposed to where are you going? Why don't you love me? Why don't you, you know, um, uh, right? I, I want to feel loved and needed and wanted and cared about, but that's an ongoing concern that can cause wear and tear on the other person. Well, this seems to be such a conundrum in relationship because in your experience, do we tend to pick the person that triggers us in the, like you were saying, the familiarity, there's like enough, I like how you said there's enough familiarity and enough mystery just to keep us sort of hooked in a way. Uh, yes, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, we're intrigued. Uh, many times we're falling in love with ourselves. I mean, it takes a year to really begin to um, separate the projections, the the idea of the other person and ourself with the other person with reality. And, you know, within that year or just after, we start to become very aware of the not so good things, of the things we don't like that we remember. And, um, and many times the very thing that we are attracted to also annoys us. This is nature's little joke. You and I have the bite that that fits each other's wound. Oddly enough, it's not the, it really that the person has that. It's not really. And because we're all memory or mostly memory, that person is going to um, is going to trigger memories going all the way back to early childhood, not the same way that your boss does or your colleagues or your friends do. Um, but this is different. Um, this relationship has the roots uh, that are similar in the earliest relationship with our originals, the people, the gods that we depended on uh, for survival in our childhood. No other relationship triggers that. And also, there are expectations and entitlements that come with this that other relationships don't have, such as we expect to be primary, you and I, and we don't tolerate being secondary or tertiary. We don't like being sidelined or relegated to third wheel. And that's another feature that seems to be psychobiological that, that is across all cultures, interestingly enough. So there's that. The idea that in coupling that we are a symmetrical system of equals equal power, authority, uh, parity, full parity, we have the same things to gain and the same things to lose, is a very difficult thing for people to hold on to in the couple situation. We tend to fall back on thinking we're family when we're not. And we're back in an asymmetric relationship where we can get away with being childish, uh, lazy, uh, impulsive, or, uh, or make the partner have to pay for our parents' sins. A lot of things that we do that we don't do in other relationships, we wouldn't dare. But again, there's something about the adult romantic pair bond that has all these features and bugs to it that make a relationship harder. And by the way, one more thing, attachment isn't nearly the problem. The problem is our species. We are, by nature, um, warlike, uh, aggressive, moody, fickle, impulsive, opportunistic, 
uh, easily influenced by groups and others, and we're xenophobic. We otherize. That is a feature uh, in the world, but it's also a bug in love relationships. Uh, you know, our comparing, contrasting mind, our always being aware of what we don't have and feeling disappointed. These are all the uh, human primate issues, the uh, human condition. And that's a greater problem that faces couples than island anger or wave. So greater than the fact that attachment challenges are being played out in our relationships. And then I, you said earlier that thinking requires more resources. So we tend to just operate based on memory and biases and assumptions. So for couples, you're saying at the sort of core of the challenge for couples, but I guess humans in general, but especially couples, is this sort of oppositional, you were said that tendency towards war, towards othering, towards wanting to win, towards wanting to be right, towards that's the main challenge. That's the main challenge. Human primate, primates are a pain in the ass, you know, disapp disappointing and difficult. There's no getting around it. If you're a human primate, you're difficult, no matter what you think you are. And uh, that's just a fact, and it shouldn't come as any surprise. What is a surprise is that people go into these unions naive and not planning for the fact that they're going to harm each other. They're going to operate, as all human beings do, according to their emotions, according to what they feel in a given day. And for a team, which a couple should be, an alliance, that's dangerous. That's that behavior, that tendency is dangerous to any any union, any team. So people then put in guardrails, um, which is a combination of stop it and do it. <laughs> and with cooperation, okay, you got it. That's teamwork. Um, and principles of how we're going to govern each other. This is what we're going to do, and this is what we're never going to do. So say the two of us. That kind of organization is a must. Otherwise, it's the Wild West. Otherwise, people are going to operate according to the moment. And people doing that are always going to step on another person's toes. I mean, is this the conundrum of relationship in general that we don't explicitly do this? Till I got older, I didn't even realize that you need to sort of come shoulder to shoulder with, you know, as you name them, agreements like these these. I guess, are they like uh, rules of engagement and how we're going to handle conflict? What's important? What do we want to create with our lives? Absolutely. These are structural things because relationships are an abstraction. They don't actually exist. You can't take a picture of a relationship, just people. So a relationship is made up in our heads, which is beautiful. We just have to make sure that we're making up the same thing and that we're envisioning. And that takes talk. That takes finding out um, why should we exist as a couple? It, it shouldn't be about feeling. It shouldn't be about love because love is uh, love comes and goes like the weather. It has to be purpose centered uh, based on things that must happen and must never happen. Otherwise, um, we'll be uh, a leaf in the wind, right? Following our feelings when it should be purpose centered. So why are we together? What do we serve? The best idea um, is at the very bottom is, is that we guarantee each other's survival as best anybody can. Survival is the main reason people uh, group together. Uh, survival of the company, survival of the rock band, and the su survival of the ice skating team, the survival of the troop, right? Um, but then also thriving. We want to win. We want to make things. We want to succeed. We have to define that. How are we going to thrive? And that's a discussion that two people make, and it must be a deal or no deal. <laughs> because in symmetric relationships, it is term-based. It is based on conditions. We meet each other's conditions, and now we're good to go, and now we're gonna hold each other to them because we share those same interests. If we don't share those same interests, we're gonna fight. We're just going to fight. And so this is why this organization idea is so very important. Yeah, because it would, occur to me that at the basis of most relationships, no matter the age of the people starting them, although you'd like to correlate age with awareness about this, I, I think it's true maybe sometimes, is that we don't start off with these these very explicit conversations. And, and is that really at the core of our relational dysfunction and our relational challenges? We like wake up to the awareness that we're not aligned, that we don't have the same values, that we don't have, that we're trying to build two different roads and we're mad 
about it? Yes, that's the biggest problem. That's the, that's the central problem facing most uh, uni- all unions and all couples, because without that structure, without that architecture, without the idea of what our ethos is, our relationship ethics, we're going to violate each other again and again and again. And then we're going to repeat because of the threat system. And that's the other reason uh, relationships don't last. Um, if you and I keep uh, accruing threat memory, which is simply a memory of being hurt, misunderstood, and it wasn't repaired, that goes into long-term memory. Now I begin to look for more threat cues, which is easy, and I start to react according to a narrative that I've created that protects my self-interests only, and you're doing the same thing, and now we become adversaries very quickly. So there's a biological threat system that we have to watch out for if we don't repair quickly, if we don't fix things and make amends, fall on our swords immediately, we create a bigger and bigger problem for us that grows exponentially. So that's the second big reason relationships won't last. Those are the two. Lack of structure, organization, and agreement, and not being able to deal with each other under stress in a fully collaborative and cooperative way. That's very hard to do. (laughs) Yeah, I definitely understand that. Because in the midst of being upset of being in conflict, I know that my baseline is to orient to wanting me to be validated and me to be right and my partner to orient around that. That would be ideal. And then we can get to hers. I'm the same way. Everyone's the same. That's why I say this is a people problem. If I were to uh, bind you, you and your partner's legs together for a month tightly and not go to jail for it um, or be sued, you would learn what I'm talking about. You would have to. You have no choice. You'd have to move together or you couldn't go to the bathroom. You could eat or drink. You couldn't get anything done. And you would feel pain if you kept pulling against each other. That is this. Um, this is a two-person psychological system of us and we working together collaboratively and cooperatively, making sure that we both win, neither of us ever loses, That is a discipline based on a reality that if we don't work together, we won't make it. If we're not allies, we're adversaries, which is dumb because, you know, that's like being adversaries in your own foxhole. You're just going to, you know, it's Darwinian. You're just not going to make it. So it's a reality check of what we are. We're not lovers. We're partners in crime. We work together. We share the bounty and we share the losses. Um, and and nobody should have um, more to lose than the other because that creates problems. Ever, if that is ever the case, that is big problems. Does that create a hierarchy, like a right, and maybe access to like righteousness or something like that? It creates jealousy, resentment, unfairness, which then turns into injustice, and that will be paid back. If I have um, uh, more uh, than you do, and uh, uh, let's say money and I make sure that my money means power, I better watch my back because I'm going to get robbed because it's unfair. Right? I've created a system that's going to hurt me. The only system that won't is that you and I have the same things to gain and lose. Therefore, um, we're in it together. If one of us screws it up, we're both done. If you haven't heard me talk about Cozy Earth Sheets before, let me tell you, I'm about to introduce you to the greatest sheets you will ever have touch your body. Anytime someone comes to our house and stays in our guest room, they always want to know what is the bed situation? What are the sheets that we have? Their sheets, their comforters, their duvets, everything is magic. Their bedding is naturally breathable. It's temperature regulating. It's so damn soft. It's ethically sourced viscose from bamboo. It's incredible. And the brand was featured on Oprah's favorite thing, But before that, it was featured on Mark's favorite things. Like, I discovered this brand years ago before I ever even chatted with them about being a sponsor for the podcast. And because I love their product so much, I asked for an exclusive offer for you, and you get 40% off site wide. And now they have pajamas, they have like loungewear. So not only do you get to wrap yourself in the experience of the sheets as clothing, but you then get to get into the bed in that. So you're like double wrapped. And so all you got to do to save 40% off site wide is use the code Groves at checkout. So just my last name, G R O V E S. So go to cozyearth.com. C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H dot com and use the code Groves and you get 40% off all their products. It's interesting. I've definitely heard 
people say like, I care more, I'm more invested loving in terms of the emotion, even though that might not actually be true, that seems like that would create that same dynamic. Well, at any time, and, and we have a lot of people today who enter into arrangements that are basically unfair. And the reason people will do this is because of the attachment system. Our attachment system is nature's glue. It's a way to keep us bound to each other so we don't you know, we're not lone wolves. So we work together as a, a twosome or a threesome or a quad or a community. However, the attachment system is a biological mandate that says, I can't quit you. And we confuse it for love. It isn't love. It is a safety issue that goes all the way back to our existential uh, crisis at birth, which is, I cannot exist without my caregiver. Uh, if my caregiver dies, I die. And so we will make terrible decisions based on the attachment system. I will give up my parity or my equality because I just can't lose you. And that's the problem. It makes people bend reality and make uh, decisions they will later regret. And that's uh, a challenge for a couple therapist. It's good that couples are stuck together because it gives us leverage to work with as a, as, a, as a clinician and it gives the partners leverage. It's bad if they cannot make a deal and uh, that is good for both of them. People will make terrible deals because they cannot quit each other and that's a problem. Mm, so they can't walk away. So if, if they can't navigate the two greatest challenges you talked about, which is getting you know aligned on, on what we're creating, the purpose of this relationship and how do we navigate disagreement or conflict or dis difficulty, then they will, I mean, we've seen this for sure. People stay together then. They'll eventually crash and burn. And we know this, it, 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 it doesn't, it's not rocket science. It's very, it's very simple. You can see the trajectory. It's very clear. Anything that's too unfair, too uh, unjust, or too insensitive, too much of the time will fail because it creates resentment and uh, and threat. And if that's not taken care of, then it, uh, it becomes uh, a snowball effect. This is, not, this is not because of who they are, it's because of how they've been doing business. That's why. When we think of structure, we're really talking about governance. Do I have your permission to govern you? Do you have my permission to govern me? In what instances do we agree that we must govern each other and hold each other to this account, the account that we decide? And then by permission and agreement, we enforce with the other person's understanding that they cooperate when uh, a principle has already been created and is agreed upon, the other person can forget, but once reminded, they must cooperate. That's how a good system uh, continues, right? That's hard to do. It's hard to do because of what you said, you know, our hubris, <laughs> righteousness, um, need to be right. We think we're really amazing creatures in so many ways and we're so stupid in other ways. <laughs> so incredibly stupid. Well, if this model of your work hasn't been taught, then, you know, it's almost like we're operating from this biological basis of inherited ways of relating that we're really not to form these love-based, long-term, deep, which, hey, when we can do it, amazing. And there's certainly people who have cultivated the skills. But absent of reading your work or listening to a podcast, Remember, we didn't live very long. It's a lot harder when it's like 70 years instead of, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever. So absent, like I think about like what percentage of couples who exist today are actually doing one or both of these things. I can't, I mean, I have hope that ones are learning it today, but I don't have a lot of belief that there's that many that are doing one, even one of those things. It's a cultural idea. It's based on an idea. It's not a skill set. The problem is, is that we're all coming from our own culture. And then we impose that culture on the other person or persons. And without, without co-creating together from the ground up our culture. So that's mistake number one. And why don't we do that? Is because biology is based on energy conservation. In other words, human beings will do the least amount necessary just to get by. Case in point, I will never look at myself or my childhood or why I do what I do unless I'm forced to. I will never do it. I may, you know, be interested to a point, but only to a point. 
the only time we really start to look at ourselves and be interested in why we do things and how we're repeating things is because we're suffering. That's the only thing, that, that's the agent of change and suffering because it's too difficult. It's just too hard. Why then would most people care about where they came from or that nature repeats itself in their part of nature or that they are not uh, putting together uh, a business, a community, a group, uh, whatever you want, a team with each other of equals. They don't even think about it. It's a mindset. If one has been in the armed forces, one understands that the person next to you is more important than you because they're going to save your life, right? It's all based on interdependency, interdependency. We all want to survive and we're going to make sure we do, uh, that everyone around us survives, right? And that's why people have courage, right? They, they don't want their, their pals to be uh, harmed. They will do heroic things based on interdependence. Well, couples don't think as interdependence. And that is, uh, that's, you know, uh, again, an idea that isn't there that would actually inform their behavior. So a lot of these, it has to do with ideas and, you know, who are we, what are we, why are we? Those are the questions that have to be answered and they cannot be based on emotion. They have to be based on real things that we can measure um, and that we will get and avoid because we both agree. So when you say real things, because I consider then is what's not real is maybe the emotional desire for a dreamy relationship that I learned from Disney or from like a rom-com, you know, that not that we can't create beautiful relationships, but that I'm more connected to the emotional outcome rather than the actual structural agreements and pieces that need to create that. Here's an example. You and I, let's say, we, we declare that we want a relationship where we both feel admired, appreciated, loved, romanced, uh, affectionate uh, throughout every day. We both think that would be a great idea. Why not? That would be better than a poke in the eye. So we both agree to that, and, we, and then we have to uh, decide, you know, how do you want your love, appreciation, admiration, and so on? It's, uh, uh, I serve you according to what you want. You serve me according to what I want. Now, here's the real hard question that most people will answer no to. Do you do this throughout every day, even if you're angry with each other? Based on what I'm talking about, the answer has to be yes. Do you do this um, uh, throughout every day if you hate each other? Yes. Do you do this if you're not feeling well? Yes. Do you do this if you're about to split up? Yes. In all cases, this is purpose-centered. It must be done. And therefore, that's awesome. Tracy and I, my wife, my partner, we have an agreement that we can go to bed angry but we have to at least touch toes. That's the minimal. And I tell you, that can be really hard because the last thing I want to do if I'm really mad at her is touch her. You know, I, I want to I punish her. But we have the agreement and it's there regardless of how we feel it must happen. And it does. And life is better for it. So when you, when you create a purpose-centered life, that's when all things are possible. All things are possible because you're not basing it on whether you feel like it or not. The idea here is we choose the best thing we can do or the right thing we decide to do, even though it may be the hardest thing to do. That is a mature, grown-up character life. And that's a hard uh, thing to, to get people to think about because most people are organized around emotion. This purpose-centered living is what protects emotions. It's what allows good emotions to exist. Otherwise, we do harm to each other. It's interesting. So there's almost like a, a rudder that's holding, like creating a safety. That toe touching, like it's not just about the toes touching. It's about the like, we're coming back to the baseline agreements that we're making and we're honoring them. And I'm still here, even though I'm kind of mad at you. My toe is touching you with love. Right. I'm mad at you. I want to strangle you, but we're okay. On an existential level, what we need for health because human primates have, have a definite existential issue with not knowing whether their relationship will exist tomorrow or not. And when people fight, there's always that idea somewhere deep in our brain that our, our, the relationship, safety, and security is in jeopardy. We're okay. I hate you, but we're okay. Is all we need to relax. Yeah, it almost feels like the nervous system, the attachment system in that moment would just be like, okay, I can be angry and in my process, but we're going to wake up tomorrow. And yeah, that's really interesting. I've never thought of the significance of what seems like a minute detail is actually maybe the main most powerful glue that actually holds the relationship 
together because there's it's a it's such a humility even in a toe touch. Oh man, I I have had trouble with all of these principles because I have to live it. I've had <laughs> be applying it with my daughter. When I say it isn't easy, I mean it. It's not supposed to, anything worthwhile isn't supposed to be easy. If you really want something, uh, then you, you have to override it when it's the hardest to do as the best thing. That's hard, but I'm sure glad that I have to do it. Um, when I say have to do it, partly because I agreed and partly also because I have to walk the talk. And so does Tracy and so does my daughter. So it, it is hard because of being human. But every time we fulfill these agreements and adhere to them, our self-esteem goes way up because we did the right thing. The integrity, the alignment to our values, both the individual and collective. And if you're creating a purpose as a relationship, I would imagine also that that then would feel like the personal expression of purpose as well. Like you have your own, but the fact that you're committed to one relationally would strike me that you'd be very motivated to committing to one individually. Yes. And the reason you're doing it is because of the agreements. You don't, we don't have these agreements with anybody else. Therefore, any, any sign or a sense of devotion to us is an illusion because uh, that, again, that's based on agreements uh, that, you know, you better not do it because you don't want me doing it. So let's not do it. We're bound as a couple to protect each other's interests. The world is not. And that's part of the reality is that we exist in an unkind world that does not have our interests and that will be proven again and again when the chips are down. Therefore, we're going to stick with each other. We're going to be in the foxhole together. Together we survive and thrive. And that's our agreements and that is worth, I don't know how you could put a value on it. It's a decision to do something extraordinary even though you're stuck with the ordinary. Here comes in the maturity of, of picking one thing and committing to it. You don't do it because it is the only thing or, or even the best thing. You don't know. You haven't surveyed everything, but it's good enough. And the reason we commit to something is because we want to learn about ourselves in the commitment so that we can explore the novelty in the ordinary. We can explore the complexity in something that seems so uh, simple and something that seems already, we think we know it, right? We think we know this person and therefore there's nothing more to learn. And so it's really uh, a self-centered uh, pursuit to uh, focus on or choose one person to devote yourself to so that you can actually explore yourself, learn yourself through learning another person. Um, that's a choice uh, based on rising above uh, the rest. I'm ready to play chess instead of checkers. And because people are really hard and these relationships are difficult, it's a career. It feels like even more of a, when you put it that way, like I think you're almost being invited to or required to on some level find the miracles in the mundane. Like we kind of forget that it, we just walk by nature and we don't realize the miracle that is a tree or that is, but that is, you're saying to find the complexity and simplicity. I love that. Like our partner is so complex and yet we reduce them to the simplicity of, and, and maybe on some levels s simple too, because we're familiar. Yeah, that's really beautiful. It's all to make everything easier and to not have to think. That's how we're built. It's not. It's it's a feature, not necessarily a bot. It's a feature to make things easier. Here's an example. I will literally carry an image of your face for weeks or months without ever looking at your face. That's how bad it is when it comes to automation. And so we're living, but we're not living. We're not in real time. We're not in the present moment. We're not uh, looking at nature, which is our partner, our children. We're too much in our heads. We're thinking about the future. We're worried about the past. And we're on screens all the time. You know, we're constantly distracted from living. This is another issue that, uh, that we have an ability to feel existentially fulfilled and not, uh, not existentially alone with a partner with whom we realize is a stranger always will be a stranger who we're constantly trying to get to know. They are not family. Family we don't have to think about. We can do whatever we want, and which is not a good thing. You know, it depends on how you want to think about this. Not everybody wants to think about partnership this way. The people listening to this do, and I think when you said we're called to explore these things. Like we're not going to sit around and be like, oh, what was my childhood like? Where were my challenges? What was my mom? You're not asking those questions till you realize 
they're getting in the way and they're suffering. And so it's interesting that the relational suffering that we experience is this invitation to self-reflection, self-awareness, self-actualization in some way, you know, and it's such a gift when we accept it as the gift. When you think about couples, because I feel like there's two scenarios. There's Couples who have never had this conversation and now are having to have it or having to explore it because of the suffering, or you're starting out a relationship and you're starting with this. Like I didn't start my relationship, my relationships at 17, 19 with like, Hey, what are our shared agreements and goals? You know, like I wish I'd known Stan, I wish I'd known, but I didn't. Don't we all? That's part of aging and, and looking and regretting and looking at all, all our mistakes and everything, I uh, wish we knew, you know, wish we knew then. But uh, we didn't. And uh, so today's a new day. So if you're a couple and you're waking up to that, we either don't have shared agreements yet, not explicitly stated, or they're feeling misaligned. I mean, those, I guess, feel like two different scenarios. But how does a couple reorganize after 10 years, 20 years? You know, and that's on top if they don't have number two down, which is how to manage conflict, which I'm guessing they probably don't because the conflict would have led to the awareness of the lack of alignment on some level. They have to recreate themselves like everybody else does. Um, How do arch enemies uh, that are forced to become allies do it? Well, nature forces them. They have to. If they're if they're bordering as neighbors, they they're tired of war. They're tired of their children dying and things terrible things happening. Let's not do that and let's do this. Let's survive together and put away our guns and show each other that we can be trusted, because we must uh, to save uh, a whole new generation. And then let's go further. Let's let's find a way to uh, actually make money to produce to put our technologies together. This has been done since the beginning of time. Enemies becoming allies. Why? Because they've had to. Or there were opportunities for them that made them uh, alike instead of others. Because this has happened and continues to happen today, we know that partners can do this. All partners can do this. They just have to know they have to, to survive. And that's the problem. People don't believe that they have to operate this way if they want to survive happily long term. People can survive long-term, but they're not happy. But if you want to be happy long-term, you have to play it as a team sport. It's not a solo sport. And so they reorganize and they they take what didn't work and they put guardrails in to prevent that from happening again. They have to walk carefully because they don't trust each other. So I, you know, if I'm going into enemy territory, I have to show there's nothing in my hands, nothing behind. I know you think I'm going to shoot because I always did. I'm not going to do it this time, and I'll show you. And that takes a while to unravel threat memory, anticipatory threat, where we shoot first and ask questions later. So they have to unwind this properly by admitting and holding on to their wrongs and never assuming that that there is a statute of limitation on wrongdoing, ever. I have to take responsibility for creating that memory in you, or it never goes away, and I can't correct it, and we can't be allies. So when people are forced to do this, they find a way Everyone does. The problem is most people don't think they should do this and therefore they don't do it and they get what they pay for. That feels like a lot of relationships when someone wants to fix it or someone wants, to, but the other person is just not all in. And if both, both people are not all in. Then it's no deal. Then the person who's not able to get their partner on board with them uh, has to say no deal. But that's the problem because of the attachment system. Most people won't do it. We'd rather stay in the relationship for fear of the rejection than, or the abandonment. It's a cynical move. It sounds like a life of never-ending suffering. Right. It's a cynical move. I'm saying I don't have faith in myself or you wanting to stay in the relationship enough to throw down. So I won't throw down because you you uh, won't care and therefore I'm the only one that does, and therefore I'm not going to throw down in that cynical. I don't believe that uh, that we can use our attachment system to force each other to the bargaining table. I don't have any faith in that. I'm going to fold, and that gives you the sense that I, I care more about loss than I do about principles. That's fatal because now you lose respect in me because I won't stand up to you. Again, it's a team of two people. There are only two. And if one is not up to speed uh, and won't show up as a co-general, then this isn't really a team. It's a one-person system. That resignation just sounds 
you know, it's like, I'm not going to leave, but I'm not really here and staying. Like I'm not present in my staying. Like I'm not really committed to anything then. And that was so powerful what you said then, that, that we really leave our values. It's loss first over principles. But this is a great many people and we understand it. To be in that situation, all one has to do is be in that situation to know how hard it is. Yeah, that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. It's all of us really. And yet that is the way that we grow and change together is that we both stand up for what is best for us, not me but me and you. And that's how we pull each other in and keep each other flying right based on what we believe is the best for the union, not just ourselves. We serve the relationship. The relationship comes first over being right. Uh, the relationship is our holy grail because it, it is what supports us and it allows us to govern each other by agreement. It's all by agreement. But again, this is an attitude. This is seeing um, a bigger picture this is placing the bar much higher than most people ever place it. If you don't place the bar high, then your life is going to be ho-hum. The average human primate, the bar is on the ground. Off the factory line we, uh, is not so good. And so this really is about using our capacity. And this, uh, you know, as human primates, the only primate that can do this. Imagine things that are not there. Create things that don't exist. The only ones. And we can use that for bad. We can use that for good. We can create an awesome life together. We just have to um, dream it together, point to it, and, and, and make each other get there by agreement and permission. I'm curious, how does an individual in that couple process the orientation to principles over attachment? Because I would imagine there's a biological process there that is seemingly like a death of a self, I suppose, who wasn't committed to principles. The only people, now we get into the attachment side, the only people who are afraid of interdependence are those people who were injured in childhood by parents who created an environment that was pro-self and not pro-relationship. There's nothing evil about that, but it is a particular culture. So the self comes first over relationship, and that breeds children who are resentful of that, but also abide by it, and then expect to turn it around and do the same thing in adulthood, while understanding that they felt ripped off. Again, this is a problem of orientation, of thinking in this way. Larger systems can enforce it, like the military. Or, you know, uh, you know, groups of people or teams were forced to comply to a team idea because we want to be part of the team. We have no choice. Without that, people are kind of lost and rudderless and they don't have this idea. It leaves it to the couple therapists to enforce this and expect it, which is really an uphill battle. But it must be done because there is no other way of relating to each other that will work. It's too uh, threatening. I have to think of you and me at the same time or you'll be threatened if I only think of me. If I only think of you, I'll be threatened. This is an achievement developmentally to think as a two-person system. It's also a higher moral development to think in terms of good for me and good for you, not transactional type, where I scratch your back, you scratch mine. That's not that level of morality. This is a much higher level and that, you know, I treat you as I want to be treated, you know, like the golden rule, but really put into place and actualized daily and how we make agreements. If it's not good for you, I'll pay for it. If it's only good for me, or if it's just good for you, you'll pay for it. It has to be a win-win or there'll be trouble. I like this call to something greater. And nobody has to believe me and just, you know, do as you're doing and see how that works. If your partner wins, you win. You know, if you win, your partner wins. If we can live this way in our romantic relationships, or even, you know, in, in any relationship, we could change our cultures, we could change our communities, we could change our politics, we could change our societies. Yep. A couple is the smallest unit of a society or civilization. It operates by rules of social justice and fairness, or it doesn't. And then that spreads out to encompass the children. Uh, and then neighbors, and then friends, and so on, because the greater human population is always going to be this way. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> terrible. The larger world is operating at at uh, ground level, very primitive, uh, civilized. Unless there's uh, unless there's too much uh, strife, too much threat, too much stress or distress, and then people do the same thing automatically. So, you know, we we get. I I only have to deal with two people. I don't have to deal with community. 
that would be really hard. Yeah, when I think about this, it seems like an act of revolution in terms of what is quote unquote normal or what we've been taught. Like it is a revolutionary act to take such a high level of responsibility for what we are not just creating for ourselves, but being committed to our principles, the integrity, but but then to be doing that as a team, as a, as a couple, and then as a family. I mean, this is like, it is everything though. The impact from a biological level of holding such a low bar or prioritizing attachment over principles, what do you see in your work and, and just from what you know from a biological level, what is the cost of not doing it, of not playing fair, of not living by your principles, of not, you know, of prioritizing self-abandonment over over like actually being committed to creating something both individually and collectively. Eventually, uh, an uh, existential despair, because um, in the end, people only really care about the relationships that they screwed up or that they made. When we play it for ourselves, and we're not given to fall on our own swords for the relationship, you know, show humility to uh, be able to repair quickly and make amends. If we don't do that, we ruin uh, our relationships. That, you know, not repairing is uh, one of the, the surefire ways of, of destroying relationships. All of these things that we do to feel better at the cost of doing the right thing are going to cost us and they're going to accumulate. It's depressing, right? So, but there's a way to do this. Um, even if we have done that. And there's a way to learn from what we have done and start to grow up and beyond our, our own self-interests, which by the way, even collaboration, cooperation, even uh, altruism um, has an aspect of self-interest to it. We could say that anything we do is actually selfish, but the higher complexity is I'm being selfish while making sure you get what you want. That serves me, it serves my interest. Because if you feel that something I'm doing is not fair or not good for you, I will pay for that. Self-interest again. And there's nothing I can do in this two-person system that won't affect me immediately. It's like you and I are on a tightrope together and we have to look at each other. Our lives depend on our ability to stay with each other and, and to read each other's faces so that we can stay balanced. My fate is tied to yours. Yours is tied to me. And that is actually the way couples are, but they don't see it that way. They don't play it that way. That's what I'm talking about. Interdependency means we have the same things to gain and the same things to lose. Insecures don't trust it. Insecures believe they're going to be ripped off. And so they act in ways that rips the other person off <laughs> to avoid being ripped off. They are the shyster first instead. Yeah, it, yeah, I'm going to get screwed, so I'm going to take care of my interests first. And that sets up uh, you know, an adversarial situation. Interdependency is cool if it's real. It is. It's interesting in the balancing or the mathematics that we do about, hey, if you win, I win. If you don't, I pay the price. Like They are both self-interested, but if you're being self-interested and looking at the relationship too, then you're not thinking if you lose, I win. You're not thinking that way. This requires a recalibration of the way that we look at relationship. And I'm wondering from a neurological perspective, if I go from being someone who is more anxiously or avoidantly attached or my um, response in conflict is, let's say, stonewalling or uh, defensiveness or criticism, whatever it might be, when I choose let's say I'm a stonewaller and at night we make the agreement to touch toes, which by the way, I'm going to implement that in our relationship for sure. I have a felt sense just imagining it of how much of a like lowering of the weapons it is. You'll feel your nervous systems just completely reset immediately. I'm like, if we get into a fight, I'm not going to repair with you right now. We're both going to sleep on this and I'm going to sleep fine because I know that you're suffering. Like that's the shadow. And you're not going to sleep fine. <laughs> no, no. So I do tend to try to repair before we go to sleep, but there's every once in a while, the little shyster in me comes out. But when we go from this place where we've always done defensiveness or whatever the cycle is, the anxious dance, the avoidant dance, and then one night I decide I'm going to do the thing I've never done and, and prioritize repair, as you're saying, which you're saying that needs to happen quick and it needs to happen often. I'd love to hear more about that. But what happens from a neurological or biological level when I touch the toe and I choose a different path? Because I think for me, that sounds like terror at first. 
You know, I, I know that what's beyond it, but historically I didn't. Like me finally saying the thing, me finally holding back maybe a little bit too from it being anxious. I didn't know what, we, like it feels like on a biological level, rejection is going to occur, abandonment is going to occur. So what happens neurobiologically after we take a shift to a new direction? Threat systems immediately uh, are disarmed, immediately disarmed. And those threat systems include, but are not limited to, certain neurochemicals and hormones that are, that are cytotoxic, burn cells, move us to an earlier death. Those threat stress hormones um, are eating away at us in a tick-tock between the point of injury and the point of repair. Nothing good is happening. We're becoming more threatening. We're becoming more distressed. We're existentially in despair. Um, and we're getting sicker physically. There is no upside. Therefore, we have to put something in place that ensures that we come back together within 30 minutes or 60 minutes, uh, no less. We are bound to that because um, without that principle, we won't self-care properly. I will do, I'll stay away and I'll stay mad. I think somehow it's, it, it does something uh, from childhood. You know, if I hold my breath, you'll see, you'll feel bad. No, nobody cares, uh, but you. So once we put that principle, it keeps us from being our, our you know, a three-year-old, a five-year-old, from doing something that's penny wise, pound foolish. Now we both have to do it. And, uh, and you can't say no if I offer the, the olive branch. Um, because you're bound by the same principle. And all you can do is, uh, is cooperate. And so this, this is what contains us, but we have to build the containers ahead of time. We can't do it in the moment because we're not ourselves. When we are insecure or threatened, we're expressing in our brains corticosteroids, and corticosteroids change our brains immediately. They make us less gracious, um, more self-interested, less willing to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. We uh, protect uh, our own interests only at those times. Uh, we're not easy to deal with. That's just with a little bit of cortical steroid. That's a human problem. That means that I have to keep you in safety and security at all times, or I have somebody who thinks I'm hostile. You're going to think I'm a predator. I'm, I'm an unfriendly. So the touching the toes is an unequivocal act of friendliness, and the system resets. I do it, and it resets. If Tracy did it, yeah, it would reset. If I only do it, the same thing will happen. I will feel better immediately. Immediately. All the thoughts, all the, the, the revenge thoughts, all the thoughts that are going through my head disappear because I now feel safe again. It's a state problem. It's not a thought problem. Our thinking is, is, is driven by our state. Memory is driven by our state. And memory is driving state. And state is altering perception like a funhouse mirror. What I see, smell, taste, feel is being altered. As soon as I change my state to one of safety and security, I can see clearly again and think. And I no longer that, that person who's in the loop remembering every bad thing you did simply because I did something to change my state. That's really the biology here. That's so fascinating. So in the feeling of lack of repair, lack of safety, when I alter this potentially, let's say one behavior and I touch the toes or I say, I extend the olive branch, what I'm, the memory I have is informing what I normally would have done. But if I can actually do change this behavior, I can completely change my state and create a new memory too. Absolutely. You, you've changed your state. You're now, uh, you know, it's like putting glasses on. You can see again, you can think again, and your partner also will be changed immediately too. This, that's a state shifting trick. There are a lot of them, by the way. We may not have time to get into them though, but there are a lot of tricks um, that people can do to, to co-regulate down from a very extreme threat state, right? It cannot be talk. It has to be a gesture that's unequivocally friendly or goofy or silly to the other person. That reset happens uh, instantaneously. It's pretty astonishing. Is that why so much of your work is based on all of the interaction, not just the verbal you know, talk therapy, but so much of it is about body position, tone, eye contact? My couples are in a workshop, right? They're, they're being trained. They're being educated. And so they're constantly be put, being put under stress uh, in a task uh, to help them practice how to work 
well together under these conditions so that they can handle anything. One of those things is to avoid working on each other, only the problem. And people will start working on each other very naturally. And that's war. That's war. As soon as I work on you, you're compelled to uh, defend yourself. And then you'll say something that compels me to defend myself. And now we're not, we're not coming back to our task. We don't get anything done. And so there are certain things that people, you know, I'll just say them real quickly. Do not go back into the past if you're dealing with a stressful topic. Uh, no uh, talk about anything that happened in the past. That's one of the things you'll get caught in and you won't get out. Memory is terrible, and you'll start arguing about memory. Don't over-describe the problem. If you talk too much, you're liable to point fingers in some way at your partner, and now they're going to say, what do you mean by that? Because you talk too long. In stress, uh, talking about a, a stressful topic, uh, we have to move much faster. We have to say less, focus more, yield the stage. It's a back and forth with a lot of leading with relief. I'm so sorry. You're right. I'm an idiot. That was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have liked it if you'd done it. Here's what I suggest for the next time. Since I am a moron, and I will do it again because I'm automatic like you, I give you permission to govern me. The next time I do this, I give you permission to cue me, prompt me, remind me in any way you want, and I promise I will yield immediately. I will cooperate. That is how teamwork works. We don't expect each other not to be annoying. That will never happen. We put in guardrails to limit each other or push each other as needed so that we're able to get things done and continue working on problems and creating things. Otherwise, we're just constantly going off road and in, into areas we can't get out of. The past is present. You don't need to go into the past. Consider what is next. Like Norman Lear says, know the difference between what's done and what's next. People are not looking forward. They're looking backwards and they're getting struck by the waves that are in the ocean because they keep looking back to see who's looking at them rather than looking forward to see if there's another wave coming. We're not prepared. A good team can handle huge load bearing without the wheels coming off. And that's what they're training for. We have to be able to work together as allies, never, never adversaries because that's dumb. It can't be that way. That's not the point of us. And then people start to uh, find ways to make this a lot easier. If you saw Tracy and me on any given day, we constantly go, oh, no, don't, no, stop. Okay, okay, go, go. No, do it. Yeah. We're moving each other around physically and we we're fine with it because we get a lot done and we have agreed. We're good with that. It's, you know, it's like, stop. Okay, sorry. Um, and I do it. Yep, we're both equally each other's bosses by agreement and previous permission. Everything two people do has to be done with previous agreement and permission. Otherwise, who died and made you my boss? I'm not going to do it. People have to understand that. Well, that's beautiful. And I appreciate you. For people who want to learn more about what you do, how you do it, the resources, where can they find more of you? And we'll make sure that we link it in the show notes and, and all that stuff. People can reach me through the PACT Institute. So stand at the PACT Institute, P-A-C-T, institute.com. Uh, I am Dr. Stan Tatkin in all social media, so you can follow me on Instagram, uh, Facebook, all of them, as far as I know. And you can find out if you're a therapist, you can get training through our institute, or if you're a couple, we do couples retreats all over the world throughout the year, and that's all there for you. Such an honor, such a pleasure, Dr. Stan Tatkin. I really appreciate the work that you put in the world and the passion and the love and, and the intention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode. If this episode resonated with you, one of the best ways to support the show is to go subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any more. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it, or share the episode with your community on Instagram or whatever social place you like to hang out. This helps get it into more people's ears, and I'm so grateful for your support, always. Thanks again for tuning in. Much love. Thank you.